In this section, we will look at more advanced functional programming concepts with F-sharp. Let's review what we will learn. At first, we will look at a very powerful concept in functional programming, that is pattern matching. Then, we will learn how to combine our functions by using map and apply. And further, we will look at a more powerful way to combine our functions using bind concept. Then, we will look at computation expressions, which is also known as monad and its respective application as async blocks, which allows us to write async blocks. And finally, we will see how to do multi-thread programming by using mailbox processor. Now let's look at pattern matching. Pattern matching is actually one of the key aspects of functional programming. You can also find it in other functional programming languages like Haskell. It basically makes use of our discriminated unions, but it is also possible to use it with string literals and numbers. And finally, it powerfully simplifies our code, especially when branching needed. You can consider them as switch case statements glorified. Here we see an example for pattern matching. In this case, I have an x variable which is set to in an integer and value of 3. And basically, I'm matching x with respect to some integers. So, if it is 0, then my match statement will return 0 in written form. And if it is 1, it will return 1. And if it is 2, it will return 2. And if it is 3, it will return 3. For all other cases, it will return a string like smaller than 0 or greater than 3. Because this is the only possible case. Since x is an integer, if it is not equal to 0, 1, or 2, or 3, then the only possible case for it being, it should be smaller than 0 or greater than 3. And after that, I'm simply printing the text. Notice that I have assigned my text variable directly against my match statement. In F# -sharp, everything is an expression, so if statements, match statements are directly assignable. If I were to run my application, as you see, the output is being three. However, if I change the x like five, in this case, the wildcard case triggers. If I omit this statement, now I start to get a warning, because Without this wildcard, which cover all other cases, my match statement is incomplete. You see, this is very powerful, since it practically prevents me to making such a mistake at compile time. Let's see another example. In this example, I have a list that is starting from 1 and ends at 15. And I'm basically assigning each element to C variable and do a for loop. Then I create a tuple on the fly. The first element of this tuple tests if c is divisible by 3. If it is divisible by 3, then it will be 0. And the second element of my tuple tests if my c variable is divisible by 5. In the first match case, I'm matching against if c is both divisible by 3 and divisible by 5. If that is so, I would print fizzbuzz. In the second case, I match against the first element being 0, so if c is divisible by 3, but I'm not interested in the second value of the tuple. But I know that it cannot be 0, because if it were 0, it would have matched the first case. So in this case, if c is only divisible by 3, it would print fizz. And similarly, if c is only divisible by 5, it would print 5. And the last element is the wildcard case. So if c is not divisible by 3, or c is not divisible by 5, then I would print the C itself. That is because for all cases that C is either divisible by 3 or by 5, it would have matched one of the three cases. So let's run. So for all cases, if C is divisible by 3, I'm ending up with fizz. And for 5, I'm ending up with buzz. And for the last element only, which is 15, and which is divisible by both 3 and 5, I end up with fizzbuzz. Another concept we need to discuss is guards. Guards basically allow us to put additional conditions for each match case. For example, for our wildcard, we can define an additional case such that when c is equal to 10, we should print 10. So let's do it. We use when keyword and we say c equals 10, then instead I want to print 10. However, 
now we see a warning has appeared. The reason for that warning is, when we put our guard by using the when statement, we are no longer covering all possible cases. Because this last case will trigger when c equals 10. And what will happen for all other cases? If we leave our code like that, and if c equals to 10, and it is not divisible by 3 or 5, then we will have an exception. So in order to solve the situation, we should put our wildcard once more, that is, Now discover all cases. How about if we do something like when c is not equal to 10. Unfortunately, the compiler is not that smart. It will not walk through this when condition statically. Although this covers all possible conditions, we will get a warning. So to suppress this warning, we have to remove this when condition. And I can enhance my example by using something called active patterns. Let phase buzz phase buzz other C as my input parameter match C with There I covered all possible cases. And now I can modify my example. And this made my code much more readable. And if I run, I'm basically seeing the same output. Also, by using the function keyword, I can shorten my function, as in, The function keyword basically does essentially the same thing with the pattern matching, just makes use of last parameter of the function as a pattern matching parameter. So although this function looks like as if it doesn't get any parameter, actually, due to the function keyword we are using, it gets a hidden last parameter, and we are basically matching the same thing. Finally, I can even further enhance my example by using partial active patterns. In order to do that, we have to define each of our cases one by one. So let's do it. Let phys. Notice that there is an underscore here which defines that this is a partial active pattern. Equals function. And I'm matching against zero underscore. And when I'm using partial active pattern, I have to use sum and num. So if first element of my tuple is 0, then I would return some this, which refers to the successful case. And for all other cases, I'm referring to unsuccessful case. Notice pattern matching can be used in line as in this syntax too. Let pause would be, again, I'm putting an underscore equals function. And zero some buzz, and for all other cases, it is none. Once I did that, because the names are overlapping with the above example, uh, my examples start to complain. I will no longer refer to the old example, but I will keep it in the code. So, to clean this up, I'm referring to my new syntax. As you see, I don't have to define a single fizz buzz, but instead, by using the AND operator, I can make use of a combination of my previous matching cases. So, if it matches to fizz and also buzz, then I would print a fizz buzz. This allows me to combine multiple pattern matching criteria, and it's a very powerful concept. So, if I were to run my example, we can see the same output is printed. Note that the pattern matching concept is not limited to primitives. 
We can also use it for discriminated unions as well as records. So let's see an example regarding to these. In this example, we first define a line type. Our line type basically has four properties. That is x1, x2, y1, and y2. And they're all integers. Next, we create an instance of our line object. And we are setting each of these properties to 1, 2, 3, 4, respectively. The next line shows us an example for inline pattern matching. That is, we are basically extracting x1 property of our record and assign it to x variable. From these curly braces, you can deduce that this is a inline pattern matching for a record. And the next line, we are printing our x variable, which is supposed to be 1. And also, similarly, we can extract our y variable. This extraction process is not limited to single property. We could have extended like. In this case, I'm extracting basically two properties. We can also consider this extraction as destructuring in C sharp 7. Next, we are again printing our Y variable. The next thing is we define a circle. Circle is not a record, but it is a single case union, which has a radius defined as integer. Then we create an instance of our circle, which has a radius of 5. And again, to show inline pattern matching, we are basically pattern matching against circle. In this case, Note that I'm using regular parentheses instead of curly braces. That is because circle is not a record. If it were a record, I would have used curly braces. But since it's a union case, I use parentheses. And basically, I'm printing the R variable afterwards. Next, I define a shape discriminated union. And I define it such that my shape can either be a circle or a line. For instance, I'm creating a line instance, which is wrapped into line case. Then I'm using pattern matching to match this shape instance. If it is a circle with R, then R is extracted out of this circle and printed. If it were a line, then instead I'm extracting the X variable. Note that this line, note that this line is because of this line keyword. It's the name of the constructor. So to avoid confusion, I could have done. Then I have to match. So don't confuse it with this line type. However, this curly braces exactly refers to the lat line because my line in this case is a record and I'm using pattern matching in line object itself. So basically, this is like a double pattern matching. Since my shape instance can only be a circle or a line 2 in this case, I don't get a warning. My all cases are covered. And if I were to run this example, basically I am seeing 1 for x1, which is in this case the x is 1. Next, I'm seeing 3 for y1 for this pattern matching case. Next, I'm printing my circles radius and capture and assign it to r, and I'm printing it as 5. Finally, I'm pattern matching against shape object that is, that is actually a line 2, and its extracted x1 variable is again 1, and I'm printing it with printfn. Also, I can use pattern matching directly as a function parameter. Let's write a function that prints the coordinates of the line. Let print coordinates. Normally, I would have taken a line as a parameter, but in this case, I will apply pattern matching directly on the parameter. That is, x1 equals x1, x2 equals x2 y1 equals y1, 
y2 equals y2. By using this, I am able to destruct the line record immediately at the parameter level. Then, all I have to do is to print these variables, that is, After defining my function, let's call it with our line instance, that is If I run our application We will see 1, 2, 3, 4 as the output This is a good example how to apply pattern matching directly on the parameter level In this section we have learned about pattern matching 